Hey guys, welcome back to Working Aussie's Homestead. My name is Jordan Kelly and I am so excited to talk to you today about animals you can raise on your homestead to feed your dog. Let's get started. Now, if you guys are new to our channel, welcome. We operate our homestead on 1.24 acres and we grow and raise most of our own food. We have a variety of animals here as well as a 4,000 square foot vegetable market garden. Uh, so our topic today is discussing different animals that you can raise to feed your dogs or your cats according to a whole prey diet. So that is focusing on the bone to meat ratio of that animal and being able to just simply dispatch the animal and hand it over to your dog and that is their meal for the day and it's going to be 100% balanced. Your dog can digest 100% of it and It'll be great because it's not only the best food for you if you're raising your own animals, but it's also the best food for your dog. Raised in a more natural and ethical way, an ethical environment, depending on how you raise your animals. Now, one of the animals we raise here on our homestead is actually meat rabbits. And we don't talk about them a lot, but they are a super easy animal to raise on your homestead. And you don't need a lot of space for them. You can actually raise them out in hutches or you can raise them like we do where we just rotate them in old dog kennels and they're great they have a great grow out rate of three months so from kit to ready to go ahead and harvest is typically 12 weeks we raise New Zealand Californian mixes we do have one buck that does have silver fox in him but their processing weight after they're dressed and whatnot is between two and a half to three and a half pounds uh, which is a perfect meal for our Australian Shepherds to be able to just go ahead and dispatch and hand this rabbit over to our dogs they can consume the entire thing and it's good food for them i'll go put this guy back another animal that you can raise on your homestead no matter how much space you have because they really don't take up that much is actually a cornish cross breed of chicken and that again is the best meat to bone ratio for feeding your dog and just simply dispatching the bird and handing it over. Your dog can digest all of those feathers, the beak, all the bones, the insides, you name it, they can digest it, believe it or not. <laughs> if you're not familiar of that, your dog originated from the wolf, who was a absolute carnivore and got those fruits and vegetables in their diet by consuming animals that would naturally eat that. So. You can definitely hand over your dog a chicken. It's gonna be able to completely digest 100% of that bird. Now, if they're not used to food that rich and that raw, it might take some time adjusting to it. That's something that your dog can eat and is actually good for them. So the Cornish cross chickens, uh, you can raise on pasture in a chicken tractor. Um, that's going to be the absolute best method of raising them for the food to be as good as it possibly can be for your dog. The next animal is actually a duck. The breed of duck that has the best meat to bone ratio is actually going to be a Muscovy. Now this is a flying breed, so if you're gonna have Muscovies and you don't want them flying away, you want to go ahead and clip their wings. We learned that the hard way. We had gone and bought some Muscovy ducks from a lady and I did not ask, I was completely new to getting ducks, but I did not ask if their wings were clipped and they were not. The day after we got these ducks, we came out and they were actually up on our roof and they decided to just go ahead and fly away. And we did see them occasionally. There's a pond just over behind our property <laughs> and we would see them occasionally, but eventually we stopped seeing them all together. So if you are going to get Muscovy ducks, make sure that you clip wings or that you have them in some sort of tractor that's going to be enclosed where they can't fly out. But in our time raising Muscovy ducks, we did really enjoy them. They were very theatrical ducks. Um, they're kind of quiet, or the females at least were quiet, and they would do this weird dance. I'll have to see if I can find the clip, but they would like kind of just do this dance with each other like, hey, 
How's it going? You're my friend. <laughs> so they were very, very fun ducks to raise. Um, super easy to process. Again, with feeding our dogs, we would just simply dispatch and hand them over to the dogs and the dogs could completely digest everything. Um, another type of animal that would actually be a lot easier to raise, especially if you have a much smaller homestead or if you don't have property at all, or if you live in the city and you want to raise something that you can kind of get away with and not have to worry about any HOAs or any laws or whatnot, um, aside from the meat rabbits, you can actually raise Katornix quail. And that is the perfect bone to meat ratio for whole prey feeding to your dog or cat. Again, just simply dispatching and handing over the animal to your dog or cat, and that's a complete meal for them. The next breed that you can talk about raising on your homestead is actually not necessarily a breed, but just a animal in general, and that would be dairy goats. So having a dairy goat on your homestead can be super beneficial. Not that you're going to just go ahead and dispatch and hand them over, but actually for the milk. That goat's milk, the raw goat's milk, is going to be one of the nut most nutritional things that you can give to your dog or cat, um, especially like for us when we raise a litter of puppies. That is what we use to transition them off of mom uh, when we start weaning our puppies. So having a dairy goat on your homestead or a dairy cow if you have the space, that's gonna be super beneficial, not only for you if you're drinking that milk, but also for your dogs and cats. So all of these animals are animals that we have personal experience raising on our homestead, except for the quail. That is one animal that we have not added We've talked about it, we've definitely tried. We did hatch out some quail at one point, uh, but the breed of quail we had were actually super aggressive, and so they ended up killing each other. That was a little traumatic to experience. Um, so we have not pursued quail further. I'm sure that was just a bad batch, but uh, for us, we just decided to go ahead and keep pursuing animals that did well for us, which are the meat rabbits and the chickens. Um, I do want to touch base on this too. So in 2020, we did a video and we talked about how we raised over 800 pounds of meat on our 1.24 acres. So I do want to just kind of put that perspective out there for you guys is, even with our small space, because we rotational graze everybody, we can raise so much food here, just on our little 1.24 acres. And we don't even use all of our land for the use of rotational grazing. Um, but it's incredible what you can do on your property. You know, one batch of 30 or 50 meat birds really does not take up that much space at all. And for the two of us, you know, if we ate a bird a week, that's a whole year's worth of food if we raised 50 meat chickens. Um, so I did want to throw that out there for you guys. Another thing is when we do lose animals before they reach their processing date, which happens, you know, we have a lot of heat here in zone 8A. We've experienced, especially with our rabbits and our chickens, that on the hottest day, no matter our efforts, we just can't keep those animals cool enough. And so two years ago, we had a litter of rabbits that were growing out. They were probably between 12 and 14 weeks old and we were growing them to be just a little bit bigger. It was the hottest day of the summer and most of the rabbits were black and I believe the temperature peaked at 118 degrees with the heat index well over 120. And that was a day where I was going out every two hours with fresh frozen water bottles, checking ice, checking water. And ultimately they passed from heat exhaustion. I just could not keep the rabbits cool enough. And for us, that's where I also had drawn the line of I'm not taking these rabbits in my house. Like these are meant for food. They're not pets, so I'm not going to bring them inside my house. You know, they are supposed to live and survive outside. So the dogs really enjoyed that day because they got to enjoy a lovely meal of rabbit. And 
you know, because I knew how those rabbits had died, I felt 100% comfortable giving those rabbits to my dogs. Um, another thing is when we'll have chickens die and we know it's not from disease, we'll go ahead and put them in a bag or, you know, put them in the freezer and freeze them for another day. And when I have a day that we're home and we're gonna be outside. Those are the days where I'm definitely more apt to give our dogs a raw meal, give them something that's going to take them some time to eat and digest. And that way I'm home to monitor if anything happens. Not that anything would, but there are stories out there. But when you are feeding your dog or cat a raw meal, it needs to be either raw as in uncooked or raw as in frozen. And there is less concern of bones being brittle, bones breaking, uh, anything not going accordingly when it comes to your dog digesting this if it is kept raw or frozen and fed raw. Um, this is where your dog's going to be able to get all of those nutrients from the meal versus cooking actually will take away a lot of the nutrients. But I do hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Be sure to follow this series along more on canine nutrition as I really hope to be able to share more of this information with you guys. Uh, some of the other animals that we have raised on our property that our dogs have benefited from is definitely when we process our Cooney Cooney pigs and our dairy goats when we process them for meat is we will actually share our harvest and our bounty with our dogs. That's where they might get a meaty bone or they'll get some of the organs. Uh, if I do keep the organs, I'll typically either feed raw, frozen, or dehydrated. Uh, that's another great way if you do have a dehydrator to go ahead and give that to your dog or cat. Um, that way you can actually save it for later. I'm gonna end that video here. If you guys have any questions, again, leave them down in the comments below. Go and hit that subscribe button if you are not already. And give this video a big old thumbs up. Tell YouTube you like this so that we can share this information with more people. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you later.